Um, our seminar speaker today is Dr. Bruce Bachner. He's the Samuel Feinberg Professor of Medicine in the Division of Allergy and Immunology in the Department of Medicine at Northwestern University in Chicago. Dr. Bachner received his MD from the University of Illinois, where he also did his internship and residency, and then moved to John Hopkins School of Medicine for his fellowship, where his research career, I think, took off. It is shocking to me how much we know today about myeloid cell function in the context of allergic disease from his work at Hopkins, uh, where he has led research groups that um, include other important researchers in the field, including Bob Schleimer and Don um, McLaughlin. And he's uh, recognized worldwide for his work. And he's the current president of the Collegium Internationale Allergologicum, or CIA. Uh, for those who don't know about this group, it's a very friendly group of leaders in the allergy and immunology field. Um, we we meet every two years to sail, enjoy each other's company, and talk science. It's, you know, those are the best meetings I ever attended. As well as he's also, he's also the past president of the International Eosinophil Society. Besides running a very productive research program, he has been an outstanding research mentor, as you can see by the productivity of his mentees, many with their own highly successful research programs today. He also gives uh, generously of his own time for service, including grant review edit and editorial activities for several journals, including uh, the Journal of Allergy and Clinical and Immunology. Over the last 20 years or so, he has shown a particular interest in cichlids as potential targets for immunomodulation of mast cell and eosinophil function in allergic disease, which we'll speak to us about today. So without further ado, I will turn, turn it over to Dr. Buckner. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Adrian, and, and thank you for the kind introduction. It's a, a pleasure to, uh, to be here with you virtually. We And all the people that I've been meeting with this morning, um, we keep bemoaning the fact that we can't quite do this in person yet, but hopefully soon. Uh, but I appreciate the opportunity. And the one thing that I'm not very good at is uh, picking up questions as I go along. So I'm, I'm going to maybe pause after one or two of the sections in case there are questions rather than just plow through and wait till the end, because I always prefer to get a question if I can while we while we move along. So there are a couple places where it makes sense. I'm going to change gears a little bit. It makes sense for me to pause and ask if there are any questions. So I'll start with my uh, disclosure slide. Um, the one thing that's particularly relevant, especially as we get later on into the talk, is some intellectual property around SIGLAC-8 and its licensing for uh, therapeutic targeting by a company called uh, Alicos based out on the on the west coast so we'll get we'll get to some of their work towards the end of uh, of my presentation so adrian suggested that i give you just a little bit of background on the allergy mast cell and eosinophil side before we get into the siglex and it's really going to be i apologize it's it's going to be brief at very high level so for those of you that don't work in the field of of allergy uh, it's all about IgE antibody for reasons that we don't entirely understand um, cutaneous or mucosal exposure to to allergens elicits a cytokine response that then results in B cells class switching uh, and, and making IgE against those particular allergens. Allergy, the IgE is, is uh, released by plasma cells, circulates and attaches to high affinity IgE receptors on eosinophils and mast cells and essentially arms them for subsequent exposure to that allergen where cross-linking of those receptors leads to uh, degranulation and release of vari a variety of preformed and newly synthesized mediators. And, and when that happens, the normally chock full mast cell on the left turns into the degranulated mast cell on the right, as shown through these electron micrographs. Um, mast cells make a lot of stuff, and I don't have time to go through it, but they, they not only can be activated through their IgE receptors, but through a whole series of other uh, potential receptors, as shown in the top of this slide, 
including MRG receptors, uh, the, probably the newest family identified. And these mediators, depending on where the mast cells get activated, cause havoc uh, during allergic reactions. Um, if I focus your attention, for example, on the right-hand part of the slide where it says respiratory, you can see that histamines, cystinylleukotrienes, platelet-activating act, platelet factor, prostaglandin D2, and others are responsible for a lot of the respiratory symptoms um, that accompany allergic disease, whether it's uh, nasal or lower airways, such as, such as asthma. So those are some of the acute responses in, in chronic allergic disease with repeat allergen exposure, you get a lot more chronic inflammation where eosinophils accumulate along with other cells. And this is accompanied by a so-called type two immune response predominated by these three cytokines, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. Classically thought of as being produced by Th2 cells, but we now know that mast cells, basophils, and ILC2s, among others, can contribute some, if not all, of these same cytokines. And IL-4 and IL-13 have activities uh, not only on T cells, but also on tissue resident cells like endothelial cells and epithelial cells, whereas IL-5 is sort of the be-all and end-all for making eosinophils at the level of hematopoiesis and also keeping them alive. And I'm often asked, why do we even have eosinophils? And I don't think there's a perfect answer, but evolutionarily, eosinophils have been around for a long, long, long time. Essentially, every vertebrate has an eosinophil or eosinophil-like cell. The zebrafish has uh, such cells, for example. And one of the things that all these vertebrates have in common is that they're all susceptible to parasitic disease. So it's still the belief that eosinophils are part of the innate immune response to parasitic disease, especially helminthic parasites. And the fact that these cells are still around suggests that they're beneficial to their hosts. Uh, this is going to be the coolest slide that I show. I, I, I like to show it early on. These are eosinophils from all sorts of reptiles and mammals from a, a nice short review. Upper left is an, is an eosinophil from a stingray. Uh, I, like, I like this one because it looks like a crocodile, and, and it's an eosinophil from a crocodile. And then bottom right, human uh, eosinophil trilobe nucleus. Um, I guess I should make a t-shirt with this on there someday. So to just give you some context, especially for those who who aren't in the allergy field, we're gonna be talking about eosinophil and mast cell mediated diseases. And there's no real clean, clear delineation, but I've tried in this slide, um, modified from my colleague, Bob Schleimer, to, to try and put this in perspective where hyper eosinophilic syndromes are eosinophil mediated, classic allergic rhinitis to the right and the bottom is mast, mast cell mediated and then Certainly food allergy and anaphylaxis is mast cell mediated, um, but then you get into gray areas like eosinophilic esophagitis and atopic dermatitis and so on, where we really don't honestly know the relative contributions of one or both of these cells. But when you talk about eosinophil and mast cell related diseases, I think this is a, a reasonably uh, useful concept and fairly comprehensive list. And then finally, as a physician scientist, one of the overarching themes of, of my work is to use pharmacology to test hypotheses. And by that, I mean, if you have a drug that's pretty specific and that drug makes a disease better than the drug target, presumably plays a role in the disease. And, and as you'll hear, we have eosinophil depleting drugs and uh, it's taught us a lot about what diseases eosinophils play a role in. So if getting rid of or inhibiting eosinophils or mast cells makes, makes a disease better, that would be a useful step forward. So now on to SIGLEX. The term SIGLEX stands for um, sialic acid binding immunoglobulin-like lectin. So these are single pass transmembrane cell surface receptors found on different subsets of cells. 
The purple tulip is to rec uh, represent the lectin or sialic acid binding uh, terminal domains. And then, as you can see on this slide, you can subdivide Siglex into, into three groups. There, there are four that are conserved between mouse and humans. Uh, then there's a CD33 related subfamily of Siglex in, in humans and in mice with mice uh, at the bottom of the slide. Those are given letters instead of uh, numbers. The other thing you should notice is that most, but not all these Siglex have cytoplasmic signaling domains shown as the, for example, the blue or uh, magenta circles. The blue ones represent classic ITIM immunoreceptor tyrosine base inhibitory motifs that recruit phosphatases. Uh, the role of the ITIM like or switch domains is, is much less clear. You can say some are really complicated like CD22 has multiple signaling domains. But then there are a couple that lack their own uh, cytoplasmic signaling domains. And some of those um, have positive charges in their transmembrane domains and can actually associate with ITAM receptors like DAP12. So examples of those for, would be CD14, 15, and 16. So we're going to focus mostly on SIGLEC8. I'm going to talk about some other SIGLECs as well, including SIGLEC6. Now, this slide um, helps to demonstrate the complexity of cellular expression of human SIGLEX. So I'm not going to go through each and every cell on this slide, but I want you to notice a couple of things. First is that um, mast cells, basophils, and eosinophils are the only ones that express SIGLEX-8. Um, poorly represented on this slide are, are classic T cells. ILCs are not on this slide because, as far as I know, they don't express any SIGLEX. And then at the bottom of the slide, since I'm going to be talking about SIGLEX 6, I want you to notice that uh, even though it's on mast cells, it's also on other cells. In fact, it was discovered from placental trophoblasts. For the purposes of today's talk, uh, I'm really going to be focusing on SIGLEX expressed by mast cells and eosinophils. Based on these mor this morning's conversation, I may have to add SIGLEC9 to the list on mast cells based on the work that you all are doing. But I'll point out two things. Uh, SIGLEC8 is on both cell types. SIGLEC6 is only on mast cells. And I will be talking a little bit about SIGLEC7 on eosinophils, CD33 on mast cells. So my role in this started in the late 1990s when a patient of mine with hypereosinophilic syndrome agreed to be part of a research collaboration where we were looking for novel eosinophil specific molecules. And uh, because he had so many eosinophils, we were able to purify large numbers. We made a cDNA library back in the day when uh, random EST sequencing was cutting the cutting edge approach here. And from this donor, a CD33-like molecule that had never been described before was found in the cDNA library. And it was the eighth member of the family, so it got the name SIGLEC8, subsequently shown to be an ITIM-containing receptor. Wasn't just on eosinophils. Once we had antibodies, we realized it's also on other cells, and that other cell turned out to be mast cells. And a lot of the published work, which uh, I've referenced in the, in the bottom right, relates to the biology of this SIGLEC based on antibody-induced ligation of the receptor. So I'll show you some of these data very briefly, but engagement of SIGLEX inhibits mast cell function, reduces eosinophil survival, and another feature of SIGLEX is that many of them upon engagement, the receptor gets internalized, and this can be used to deliver payloads as a result. So I'll show you a little bit of the data just very briefly. Here's one of the original papers showing that if you co-engage SIGLEC8, you, you can get um, marked cell death, especially if you included a secondary cross-linking antibody. So you needed a fairly strong signal to induce eosinophil death 
and that in the presence of a survival cytokine like IL-5, which normally prolongs their survival, it actually, sorry, it actually shortens their survival. And that's best shown in the bottom panel where in the presence of IL-5 or GMCSF, a related cytokine, you actually get enhanced cell death. And 2E2 is, a, is the SIGLEC8 antibody. So normally IL-5 would keep these cells alive, but in this particular situation, cytokine priming actually makes SIGLEC8 signaling and cell death more effective. Now the classic way that CD33 related SIGLECs function is through their ITIM domains by recruiting a variety of phosphatases. And as shown on this slide, on some situations, the ligand for that SIGLEC might actually be in cis. It might actually be through binding of a sugar on another cell surface activating receptor. But if that activating receptor contains an ITAM, then it would make sense that the phosphatase is recruited by the SIGLEC undo any of the kinase signaling that would normally have occurred through the, through the activating receptor. So this is sort of the canonical signaling as we understand it for CD33-related SIGLECs. Now, it turns out for SIGLEC8-induced eosinophil death, it's not so canonical. Uh, this is work by Daniela Carroll from a few years ago, a graduate student in the lab at the time, who noticed that when cytokine prime eosinophils were exposed to SIGLEC8 antibody, they actually spread on plastic. And she went on to show as part of her PhD thesis that this process induces CD11B upregulation and enhanced activity, and that the eosinophil death required adhesion and was dependent on reactive oxygen species generation. So if you inhibit any of these steps, you prevent the eosinophil from dying in vitro. Uh, she, together with Jeremy O'Sullivan, uh, junior faculty, former postdoc, um, have explored this in greater detail with pharmacology. Um, we now know that a variety of kinases, including SICK, PI3 kinase, PKC, and others, are involved in the early stages of SIGLEC8 engagement induced signaling. Uh, this leads to CD11, CD18 enhanced activity, which is necessary for cell death, some of which is dependent on BTK, and that the firm adhesion is required to generate ROS, leading to cell death. Now, I mentioned that these SIGLECs also get internalized. So the data on this slide, upper panel, shows your eosinophil levels of SIGLEC8 over time. Bottom panel, it's using a, a malignant mast cell line. But you can see within uh, about two hours, about 70% of the SIGLEC gets internalized. And it actually uh, recirculates. If you take the um, antibody out of these cultures, the SIGLEC receptor will come back out onto the cell surface. And, and Jeremy, O'Sullivan leveraged this pathway to actually uh, use uh, an RNA toxin linked to the SIGLEC8 antibody that was then brought inside the cell and released as a cargo and, and showed that this was a very effective way to kill uh, malignant mast cells. And he worked out some of the mechanistic pathways involving dynamin and, and clathrin to define how these um, lysosomal dependent processes worked. So that's a little bit of background on SIGLEC8. The closest molecule when it comes to mouse eosinophils, the closest functional paralog is SIGLEC-F, as in Frank. Also highly expressed on eosinophils, a lot of people use this as an eosinophil marker for studies that, uh, that they do in mice. Uh, but it does differ from SIGLEC8 in a number of ways. First of all, it's not expressed on mast cells. Uh, second of all, it's expressed on cells uh, in a pattern that's different from humans, namely it's on alveolar macrophages and uh, tuft cells in the mouse and can also be expressed at low, low uh, densities on a, a few other cell types. 
Now we call it a functional paralog because it's on eosinophils and because it shares some ligands. And I'll get into that a little bit later. But it turns out that SIGLEC F binds more sugars uh, than does SIGLEC 8. It, it binds a broader pattern. Uh, SIGLEC F also recognizes different glycoproteins. So, for example, uh, I'll show you some of these data. It recognizes sugars on the mucin MUC 5B and the mouse airway, but SIGLEC 8 does not. Actually, uh, MUC 5B carries glycans that allow it to bind to SIGLEC 9, not SIGLEC 8 in human airways. Uh, eosinophils in the mouse do not really die when have, they have their SIGLEC F engaged, nor do they make ROS. So what little bit of death you get is very different from what you see with human eosinophils. And um, I will point to the new PLEZ paper at the bottom of this slide, uh, another uh, grad work by a graduate student showing a much better way to deplete eosinophils than targeting, uh, targeting SIGLEC F. And one of the ways that we've studied this is by making uh, knock in mice. Um, so we've bred a, a Rosa SIGLEC 6, uh, sorry, Rosa SIGLEC 8 floxed mouse with uh, Jamie Lee's EO cream mouse to selectively put SIGLEC 8 into the mouse eosinophil compartment. Keep in mind that SIGLEC F is still there. So we've actually bred that out by crossing them with a SIGLEC F null mouse. We've done this, a similar strategy to put SIGLEC 8 into the mast cell compartment in mice uh, using either MCPT5 or CPA3 Cree mouse uh, strains. So here's some of the data from um, Eva's work. Uh, showing you that dosing mice with anti-SIGLEC F antibody really doesn't effectively deplete eosinophils from either the blood or the spleen. But if instead she uses a SIGLEC-8 antibody, either the 2C4 or the 2E2 antibody, you can see in the upper panel on the right marked eosinophil depletion at 24 hours. And interestingly, this is not due to SIGLEC-8-induced death, but is actually due in, uh, the result of antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. And we know that because an FAB prime two version of this antibody does not deplete eosinophils, even though it is equally effective at cross-linking SIGLEC-8 on these cells. So we actually think that this mouse, the SIGLEC-8 knock-in mouse, given anti-SIGLEC-8 antibody is a much better way of depleting eosinophils uh, for studies that require that as part of the biology. And we're happy to share such reagents if needed. Switching back over to the mast cell. Um, the mast cell, as most of you know, is equipped with high affinity IgE receptors that signal through ITAM domains in the, uh, in the gamma chain of the, of the heterotrimeric receptor. And uh, in collaboration with Jim Paulson's group at Scripps, uh, they've done a couple of very cool things. First of all, they've generated some high affinity glycomimetic ligands shown in the upper left-hand panel that are very specific for SIGLEC-8. Second thing that they've done is that they've put these on liposomes so that you can deliver this ligand and actively engage SIGLEC-8 both in vitro and in, in vivo. They can also equip these with a fluorescent tag so that they can see where they go. But most importantly, in the middle of the slide in panel A is that they can also add to these liposomes or decorate these liposomes with allergens and then give the mast cells or mice allergen-specific IgE. So as a result, you end up with a liposome that will co-engage both IgE sitting in its high affinity receptor and the inhibitory receptor, SIGLEC8. And shown in panel B is the consequence of using such a reagent. And what you see is inhibition of some of the downstream phosphorylation events that you would have seen uh, as a result of IgE receptor engagement alone. So compare the, uh, the middle to the right uh, parts of panel B. 
And more importantly, not only can you do this with SIGLEC 8, you can do this with other SIGLECs. So in this particular JCI paper, instead of putting a SIGLEC 8 ligand, they, they used a CD33 ligand to do essentially the same thing. And then they sensitized these mice with allergen-specific IgE and then challenged them uh, in anaphylaxis. Uh, one of the readouts in these assays is drop in body temperature due to vasodilation. You can see that the control mice um, who lack the SIGLEC ligand, um, uh, sorry, the control mice who lack CD33, uh, given this ligand, still anaphylax, whereas in panel H, uh, shown in the red curve, uh, they are protected from anaphylaxis. Now, there are other ways to study SIGLEC-8 in uh, preclinical models. This is work done by the group at Alicos. Uh, they've made their own SIGLEC-8 knock-in mouse. So um, this particular mouse uh, has SIGLEC-8 expressed on both its mast cells and its eosinophils using a different approach. Uh, and what they published in this paper was a model of eosinophilic GI disease where the animals are sensitized and then repeatedly challenged uh, by intragastric lavage and develop increased eosinophils and mast cells throughout their GI tract. And in this model, when they give these mice anti-SIGLEC-8 antibody, you can see they no pretty much normalize the number of eosinophils in the stomach, mesenteric lymph nodes, blood, and, in and intestine. And they also markedly reduce the number of mast cells accumulating at these three tissue sites. So this was uh, early preclinical testing that led to some of the clinical testing that I'll get to at the very end of my, of my talk. The other way in which this can be studied is in one of two animal models in involving human mast cells, so-called humanized mast cell mice. First model was developed by my colleague, uh, Paul Bryce, a uh, former colleague here at Northwestern, involves uh, the use of these NSG SGM3 mice. So they're, they're making stem cell factor GMCSF and IL-3. And the first iteration of this, uh, you had to irradiate the mice, you gave them human uh, fetal tissues and stem cells waited a while, and these mice would be populated with uh, mast cells. And he went on to show that these uh, mast cells uh, and eosinophils had SIGLEC-8 on their surface. So this led to a, a collaboration with the folks at Alicos involving uh, so-called passive sensitive, uh, passive systemic anaphylaxis, where they give the, the mouse SIGLEC-8 antibody or not, Wait a day, give them allergen specific IgE that will only bind to the human mast cells and not the mouse mast cells. Then they challenge the animal systemically with, with allergen. And again, the take home message is the same as what I showed you previously that you can protect these mice from anaphylaxis by pre treating them with AK002, which is the SIGLEC 8 antibody. So I'm going to stop there because I'm about to start talking a little bit about SIGLEC-6 uh, in case there are any, any burning questions. Otherwise, I'll talk about SIGLEC-6 and then we'll, we'll get into some of the glycobiology and, and what these, these receptors recognize. Okay, well, I will, I'll continue on then. So let's talk a little bit about SIGLEC-6, um, it was originally identified on trophoblastic cells of the placenta. It's got about 40 to 50% homology with SIGLEC-8 and is highly and selectively expressed on, on human mast cells. There is no mouth, mouse ortholog, in fact, um, below non-human primates, SIGLEC-6 uh, doesn't appear to exist. It also has an ITIM and an ITSM domain, uh, and we know relatively little about it, uh, nor are the natural ligands for SIGLEC-6 very well defined. So we were interested in studying SIGLEC-6, and this was work that um, was just recently 
published and uh, Adrian actually heard a little bit about earlier this morning. For these experiments, um, we got our hands on as many different kinds of human mast cells as we could. Panel A is uh, growing human skin mast cells from discarded uh, normal skin specimens, uh, human skin specimens, mostly from plastic surgery specimens. You can see that by nine to 12 weeks, the mast cells are greater than 90% pure. Panel B shows you that by flow cytometry, there's roughly 100,000 SIGLEC6 molecules per mast cell, and that's pretty stable in these cultures. And panel C is a, a typical flow cytometric histogram of SIGLEC6 expression. In the bottom of the slide, we looked for SIGLEC6 on a variety of uh, available human mast cell lines, HMCs, LUVAs, uh, ROSAs that are either wild type or contain a, the gain of function D816V mutation that's um, classic for systemic mastocytosis. And all the cell lines have SIGLEC6, but only some of them have SIGLEC8. Um, and in fact, the ROSAs and the LUVAs do not have SIGLEC8. And the reasons for this is not entirely clear since we know very little about what regulates uh, the turn on of the SIGLEC6 and SIGLEC8 genes. There's plenty of data in the literature that SIGLEC6 is selective for mast cells. Uh, we wanted to take this one step further and had the opportunity in human esophageal biopsies to collaborate with a couple of labs that could give us access to single cell RNA seq data. And the whole point of this slide uh, is that you can see that SIGLEC6 is only on mast cells. SIGLEC8 is only on mast cells. You don't see the eosinophil signature in single cell RNA seq because the eosinophils don't survive. And then you can see other ways of displaying these data here. This is um, a data set from the University of Cincinnati. This is a data set from uh, Josh Wexler here at Lurie Children's at Northwestern. They all make the same point that SIGLEC6 and SIGLEC8 are highly mast cell specific. We we're interested in exploring some of the functional consequences of engaging this receptor on, on mast cells. So these are experiments with human skin mast cells activated either with an antibody to the IgE receptor or by activating other endogenous uh, seven spanner receptors like C5A receptor or with compound 4880, which we now know activates uh, one of the MRG receptors on mast cells. And in each case, uh, we see modest inhibition of degranulation when SIGLEC8 is engaged on these cells. Um, so at, at best about 20 to 25% inhibition and the inhibition is sustained uh, at least for out to four and a half hours, which is as far as we look, that's in panel D. But following the concept that I introduced earlier, co-engagement of the ITIM and the ITAM simultaneously has a much more profound effect on these cells with the ITIM signaling winning out. And that's shown in this slide um, using secondary antibody to co-crosslink an antibody to the IgE receptor and to SIGLEC6 simultaneously. So left-hand side shows you a readout of degranulation, namely uh, CD63 positivity on these cells, about 60 to 70 percent inhibition. And uh, the, the next four panels measure secretion of a variety of mast cell mediators, all of which are effectively inhibited, especially tryptase release from these mast cells, much more so by co-crosslinking compared to the previous slides. And, and we've just begun interrogating some of the downstream consequences in terms of signaling. And so far we've seen what's been expected, less phospho ERK, less phospho P38 when you co-crosslink. So just to summarize uh, what we've generated so far with the SIGLEC6 story, we get some inhibition of activation if we separately activate various receptors in the presence of an antibody that crosslinks SIGLEC6, but the better 
effects are seen when we use a either secondary antibody or a streptavidin strategy that will provide you with a multi-scaffold based co-cross linking. Um, I think for the sake of time, I will skip this slide. Um, so we also wanted to study this in a model of anaphylaxis and um, Melanie Dispenza, a, a former allergy fellow in the group, helped to generate a second, more simple model of humanized mast cell mice. It uses the strain, same NSG, SGM3 strain. But this, this approach is much simpler in that you just give these mice human cord blood CD34 positive cells that you can buy commercially. Essentially, wait 16 weeks and the mouse gets gets repop repopulated. So you don't need any radiation. You don't need embry any embryonal tissues. And what Melanie showed in this uh, this JCI paper, she was actually interested in using BTK inhibitors to inhibit anaphylaxis. But in defining these mice, uh, what you can see on this slide, uh, the human mast cells are in the gray bars, and mouse are in the white. So the first thing you notice is that these mice have both mouse and human mast cells. Second thing you probably notice is that certain tissues have more of one than the other. Um, so for example, the spleen of these mice have a lot more human mast cells. The skin of these mice have a lot more mouse mast cells. But you can use this model, uh, sensitize them with IgE and, and have them go under, undergo anaphylaxis and it works quite quite nicely. So in a, in a separate ongoing project in collaboration with the nanoparticle group on the Evanston campus at Northwestern, we've been trying to develop a sustained therapeutic that would co-engage the SIGLEC and the IgE receptor. And one of these is a PPSU nanoparticle that, um, that aggregates under aqueous conditions and uh, to the tune of about 40 to 80 nanometers and onto this nanoparticle you can um, decorate with various antibodies at various densities. So panel B shows the decoration of this nanoparticle just with an anti-IgE antibody or anti-IgE receptor antibody which by itself would induce uh, degranulation and anaphylaxis, whereas in panel B2, now you have two different antibodies, the hypothesis being that that one will lead to inhibition. Uh, this is work done by Clayton Rich, and a, a graduate student in the, in the lab. And he put these mice through that exact same mouse model of anaphylaxis as the one I just described. And in some of his, some of his uh, most recent unpublished work, gets tremendous protection from anaphylaxis. So the key curves to, to note on this slide. Uh, upper panel is clinical scores of the mice, lower panel is temperature drop. And the one that uh, curve that to look at is really the blue. That's the PPSU particle displaying both antibodies to SIGLEC6 and to the high affinity IgE receptor. Those mice are protected from anaphylaxis. So this is another good place for me to stop briefly because I'm going to shift gears and, and get into a little bit of the glycobiology, what some of the ligands are for, for the, especially for SIGLEC-8. And then we'll talk at the very end, if there's time, about some of the clinical translation that's ongoing. So any, any questions that anybody wants to raise at this point? Okay, onward then. Um, at the time that we got into studying SIGLEX, uh, we realized early on that we were going to have to learn some glycobiology because these recognize sialic acids. So besides finding out where my old biochemistry book was, <clears throat> we were in search of collaborations and, and new tools for studying uh, glycan ligands for SIGLEX. And we were fortunate in that the NIGMS had just funded a consortium for functional glycomics, the, the goal of which was to develop a whole series of new tools for studying glycobiology. Two of them were incredibly important 
and um, and elegantly simple. The first was to to develop these glycan arrays. So you take a slide and you immobilize hundreds of different sugar structures. That then allowed you to take a lectin of interest and see what sugars that it bound to. In our case, uh, we and others were able to make Siglec FC uh, Ig chimeras. And essentially you can do an ELISA on this plate by looking to see whether your Siglec uh, FC structure bound to any particular sugars. The other thing that was that was developed was so-called shotgun glycomics, where you take take a tissue apart and put all the glycoproteins on a slide, or you simply uh, do it histologically, and then you use your SIGLEC as a probe to see if there are any sialic acid containing sugars on the tissue or on the tissue derived cells capable of recognizing your your SIGLEC of interest. So when this was done early on, uh, we were able to provide SIGLEC-8 and SIGLEC-F IG fusion proteins. And if you focus on the top half of this slide, you can see that these functional paralogs, SIGLEC-8 and SIGLEC-F, bound to two structures on uh, out of 600 and some that were very, very similar. Uh, the second structure was so-called six prime sulfated sialolus X. So sialolus X is this structure here uh, with the colored colored uh, colored symbols, purple being sialic acid, yellow being galactose, blue square being N acetyl glucosamine, off of which was a, a red square, which is a fucose. So that's um, Silo Lewis X, which was of interest because that's a, a, a ligand for all of the different selectin adhesion molecules. But Silo Lewis X wasn't a ligand for SIGLEC 8 and SIGLEC F. You needed this sulfation on the galactose to be there, the six prime sulfation. And interestingly, this sugar was also on the array in which the fucose was missing. So it showed that the fucose was dispensable for binding. And interestingly, at the time, none of the other SIGLECs, and there are about a dozen or so, bound to this sugar structure. Subsequent versions of this glycan array had much more fancier multi antennary sugars. And this is where we began to see that there were certain sugars recognized by mouse SIGLEC F that were not recognized by human SIGLEC 8. So we took this information and then again with collaborators uh, generated tools to study whether or not these glycans uh, were truly selective and specific. So here I'm showing you a cartoon of a polyacrylamide flexible polymer onto which uh, a glycan of interest was decorated along with biotin so that we could use it as a flow cytometry tool. And we essentially put this into anticoagulated whole human blood and you can see here that the only signal of, for binding was with the eosinophil. Neutrophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes, which lack SIGLEC8, did not bind this. And this same reagent, when added to eosinophils, would cause enhanced adhesion, enhanced CD11B expression, enhanced reactive oxygen species generation, and, re and enhanced cell death. So not only does an antibody to SIGLEC8 cause this, but so too does an artificial ligand. Now I'm going to foreshadow the next couple of slides uh, as we get into potential tissue ligands for SIGLEC8. And this will help you understand some of the treatments that were used to define which glycoproteins actually carry these important gly uh, glycans. So there, there are two important tools that are going to be uh, used on the next couple of slides. One is sialidase or neuraminidase that removes the terminal sialic acid. And then there are two different keratinases that will cleave keratin sulfate at different parts of the molecule. And so what, you're get, what you can guess I'm foreshadowing is that keratin sulfates on various proteins 
carry ciglecate ligands. So here's an example of one such study done uh, by collaborators at Johns Hopkins, uh, Ron, Ron Schnarr's lab, using histochemistry to ask the question in human airway, are there ciglecate ligands? So you can see in pink that there are glandular ligands and there are cartilaginous ligands. And on the right, if you treat with sialidase, all the staining goes away. So that tells you that there's sialic acid on something in these tissues binding ciglec 8. Same approach can be used uh, using some of these keratinases that also removes all staining. And that's based on the fact that um, affinity chromatography was used to pull out the ligand, and then it was subjected to glycoproteomics. And that led to uh, a hint that keratin sulfate was highly enriched in these materials. And on the right-hand side, you can take purified material from human airway, incubate it with eosinophils, and it causes the eosinophils to die. We've also started looking in the upper air human airway. Same kind of approach, same story. There's a lot of ciglecate ligand in upper airway glands. These are uh, biopsies of human inferior turbinates. Ligand is sialidase sensitive. And not only that, but if you look in normal nasal mucosal biopsies versus biopsies of patients who either uh, who have chronic rhinosinusitis either without nasal polyps, shown here, or with nasal polyps, not only are there more glands, but these glands are chock full of ciglecate ligand. So what is this ligand in the upper airway? Uh, long story short, it's different than the lower airways in that it's carried on a different glycoprotein, and that glycoprotein is called DMBT1, a glycoprotein that in, in um, previous gene arrays has been shown to have been increased in nasal polyps. So what I'm showing you here is co-localization of Siglec 8 ligand and DMBT1, um, carrying ligand that's sialidase sensitive. So this ligand was immunopurified, uh, sorry, affinity purified, and again, subjected to glycoproteomics, and that's how DMBT1 was identified. This stands for deleted and malignant brain tumor one, but it's also a salivary protein, so it has a couple of different names, and it's highly glycosylated, and both this ligand as well as agrican from the airway both have keratin sulfate, and it's these keratin sulfates that carry the ligands for SIGLIC8. DMBT1 has had uh, a number of proposed functions, um, and so it's not entirely clear what this glycoprotein is doing uh, in nasal secretions, but it does carry SIGLIC8 ligand. So that's summarized on this, this slide. Glandular secretions, Ligand is carried by DMBT1, and I should say there's really only one, for some reason, there's only one carrier of Siglec 8 ligand in the airway that we've been able to identify. And then in the structural cells in the cartilage, it's carried on agrican, and it's all due to this terminal structure here with the six sulfation that allows it to bind to. So in the last part of my talk, um, I want to take this to the next level, which is, uh, is there a way to use some of what I've talked about therapeutically? And as um, some of you, I'm sure, know, we now have FDA-approved drugs, uh, three biologics that target eosinophils. Mepolizumab and reslizumab target interleukin-5 and reduce eosinophil numbers uh, due to the neutralization of IL-5. The other approved drug, benralizumab, also blocks IL-5 function, but it has an additional activity in that this antibody actually binds to the IL-5 receptor itself. And it's afucosylated, so it has enhanced affinity for IgG receptors on NK cells, and it 
Benralizumab is extremely effective in depleting eosinophils through ADCC. Shown on this slide also to the left is lirantelumab. That's the humanized anti siglec 8 antibody. Uh, it too is afucosylated and so has enhanced ADCC activity. But the difference between lirantelumab and the other approved antibodies is that it would, at least in theory, have anti-mast cell activity through some of the inhibitory biology that I've described earlier. Alicos was founded in 2012 by licensing some of the intellectual property from Johns Hopkins where the, the SIGLEC-8 antibodies uh, were housed at the time from work in my lab. So now fast forward uh, 10 years later, this antibody has now been tried in a variety of mast cell and eosinophil diseases. Um, Positive results in an open label study in systemic mastocytosis with improved symptoms. Two subsequent uh, publications studying this antibody in severe allergic conjunctivitis and in chronic urticaria. The references are here on the slide. But the big one that I want to spend the remaining time on has been in eosinophilic GI disease. And as you're about to hear, if you haven't heard already, this is a good news, bad news story. So here's the good news. You give SIGLEC-8 antibody to patients with eosinophilic GI disease, and as shown at the bottom of this slide, their eosinophils disappear through ADCC activity in the blood. Uh, placebo uh, eosinophil levels remain pretty stable. So the big publication, uh, October 2020, was a phase two placebo-controlled multicenter trial of anti-SIGLEC-8 antibody for eosinophilic gastritis and duodenitis. Protocol is here, four monthly IV doses, uh, biopsy before, biopsy after. They also explored two different dosing regimens, one of which was a, ended up in a milli, one milligram per kilogram, the other one was three milligrams per kilogram versus placebo, about 20 people in each group. Primary endpoints on the right, uh, reduction in eosinophil numbers in the tissues, and then a couple of other secondary endpoints. So here's the primary endpoints, pretty much a home run. On average, 95% uh, reduction of eosinophils in either the stomach or the duodenum compared to a small 10% increase on placebo. And then these were the patient reported outcomes with AK002 or SIGLEC8 uh, antibody lirantelumab showing improved symptoms over time. Uh, you and you should also note that there wasn't much dropout in this study. Uh, 20 patients in the placebo group, 18 made it to the end. 39 in the active treatment groups, 36 made it to the end. Uh, this slide shows you uh, not just the eosinophil data. Uh, this is uh, eosinophil patients of uh, eosinophil counts of 30 per high power field or less. 95% uh, met that endpoint compared to much smaller numbers on placebo. But interestingly, notice on the bottom of the slide, mast cells were not very markedly depleted. 17% decline on drug compared to a 17% increase on placebo. And it may be that NK cells don't have access as readily to the mast cells in these uh, uh, in these diseases, but that's not entirely clear. So more good news. Uh, Alicos says they're going to go after some other diseases, eczema, urticaria, and asthma, but then the other shoe dropped. Phase three study designed pretty much just like the phase two New England Journal study. Big announcement right before Christmas this past year. The drug met histologic endpoints, so it got rid of eosinophils but it missed symptomatic co-primary endpoints. Patients did not show significant improvement compared to placebo. So the results haven't been published. There've been a, a, a few discussions about why this might be. I think we'll have to wait for the publications. And then finally, a couple months later, Alicos announced uh, development of AK006. So that's gonna be their anti-SIGLEC6 antibody. Uh, which is going to be explored in future clinical studies.
So I'm just about out of time, uh, but I do want to thank uh, all the folks that were involved in these studies. It takes a village, a number of academic collaborators, folks at Alicos who've been uh, both involved in preclinical as well as clinical studies, and then all the funding agencies. Uh, and I think I'll stop there and we'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Bruce. That was amazing. Thank you so much for all this overview of Siglex and their effects and mast cells and eosinophil functions. So these are open for questions. I have I have a very very easy one, and it's on the uh, second method for the generation of the humanized mouse model and looking yep. into mast cells. So. He said, um, have you tried the PCA model on those mice or it's, you don't see an effect because you don't have a lot of masses in the skin? So we, have, we haven't done PCA. Uh, one of our collaborators has, and it does work, but oh, cool. not nearly as well because there aren't, you can see, as you pointed out, there aren't that many eosinophils in the ear. There's there's some on the back skin, but I think because we give the CD34 cells IV, they go to other places and then they, they go on to develop into, into mast cells. So it's a much more robust molecule, uh, a model for PSA than PCA. Right. Uh, the other question that I have is about the DMBT1 the ligand that is found yes ways so uh is that um you see have you looked at differential expression of that ligand in patients um, or they're just um, uh, the collaborators who discovered that the folks at hopkins are just now collecting uh, nasal secretions from various patients this is one of the things that uh, jason and i had talked about and uh, whether or not um there might be some variability there. There's a little bit of that data. Sorry, wrong way. A little bit of that data in this paper. Uh, no, this way. I will just point out this one paper just because there's a little bit of that data here in this glycobiology paper. Yeah. They, they begin to look at heterogeneity. And there are some samples that have a lot of the ligand. Mm -hmm. uh, the other point maybe I should make that I didn't make when I showed this slide is not all DMBT1 carries ligand, only a fraction. Oh. Same, with, same with the mouse studies, same with Agrican studies. So there's heterogeneity within a given sample that only a, a subset carries the ligand. So in fact, in this paper, they refer to it as DMBT1 superscript S8L for SIGLEC8 ligand. Oh. So not all DMBT1 has the right sugars on it. And what determines that is, is not known, but is under, under study. So thank you for that question. That was, it's an important point that I didn't mention. Yeah. I'm sure I have more questions here. I wrote down a lot of stuff, but I don't wanna take over the uh, time for more questions from other people. <laughs> I was just going to jump in to build on the conversation we had earlier. Yeah, you could see how in clinical trials, if there may be responders and non-responders that relate to their ligand status <laughs> for shorthand. Um, I, had a, I had another question about um, the anti-cyclic 8 antibody. Do, would you speculate that the less robust um, reduction in mast cells is one of the reasons that could also be another reason why they didn't respond? It's possible. You mean the, the failed phase three trial? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, it's it's possible. I it'll be really interesting. It you know, that study was three times the size of the phase two. And um, you know, clearly the drug worked in terms of depleting eosinophils. So either eosinophils are not the be all and end all of the pathophysiology of that disease, or um, it is possible that they put some patients into the study that met histologic criteria uh, 
and um, but maybe didn't have the right diagnosis. That's been hinted at through the one of the press releases that Alicos had. Um, so they're going to have to figure that out. Um, and then um, how sick these patients were. Um, if they're not all that sick, then you're more likely to see a placebo response. So depending on how how ill these folks were. So at, at least in their press release, um, and again, they haven't published the data, so this is just them telling us what they found. Um, there were two things of interest to me anyway. One is that if they looked at patients who had the high, highest level of eosinophilic disease at the time of enrollment, those folks responded to drug clinically. They also enrolled a lot of folks from academic centers versus non-academic centers. And if you focused on the individuals recruited from the academic centers, they met clinical criteria and outcome. So if it had just been a study of sicker academic patients, post hoc analysis, take it as you will, um, they would have hit all their endpoints. I see. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, and sad. <laughs> but again, the, the data haven't been published. They've they've discussed this in a in a press release. I think we should probably wait until we see the data published. But that's what they've put out there. Right. And we have a question in the chat, and this is from Irina. So she's she's asking about the negative the potential negative implications for eliminating eosinophils by cyclic ligation in patients. And I guess the same applies to mass of that we still really don't know. Yeah, it's a fair question. I mean, there there's there's a growing literature um, regarding the good things that eosinophils do, especially in homeostasis. I probably wouldn't want to have a parasitic infection and not have eosinophils. Right. Um, there's some hints, especially in mouse models, that eosinophils can uh, have anti-tumor effects. Yeah. Um, probably the best thing to point to is is the <clears throat> what's happened since benralizumab has been around. Since that that's a very effective and sustained yeah. eosinophil depleter, and there haven't been any. Um, sinister things come up uh, in those individuals. Ha has anyone been on that drug for 20 years? No, but I think it's reassuring at least so far. Now, in terms of getting rid of mast cells, you, know, you and I, Adrian, we were talking about this earlier. To my knowledge, there are no mast cell deficient people. Yep. Until recently, courtesy of antibodies to kit. Antibodies to kit are very effective at getting rid of human mast cells in people. But it's a little tricky because it gets rid of other kit positive cells. Oh, that's right. Um, so it has effects on other cells. Um, kit is also important for generating pigment in skin structures. So if you want to make somebody gray, <laughs> uh, give them an anti-kit antibody and they will they will turn gray. Um, so, um, we haven't been brave enough or stupid enough or smart enough to try to create mast cell deficient people, but we're doing it now. So we'll, right. I guess we'll find out soon. Thank you. Any, any other questions? So, so how sens radio sensitive are mast cells? They're uh, relatively because, because uh, or no uh, sensitive to chemotherapy because uh, when you do hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, we eliminate T cells very nicely, uh, other stem cell derived cells. But I do not know what happens to the mast cell during these procedures, either uh, chemotherapy or or irradiation. Yeah, to my knowledge, they're they're pretty radio insensitive. Uh, they're slowly dividing pretty hardy cells. They're also steroid insensitive. Yeah. They're kind of hard to get rid of. 
So, you know, we, we look in transplantation, we look at chimerism between the donor and recipient, but we never look at mast cells. So would you predict that the mast cells stay host, even if uh, no, all the other hematopoietic stem cells are replaced by the donor? And would that have implications of you know, persistence of autoimmune disease or persistence of allergies uh, in, in the recipient? Yeah, it's a great question. The half-life of the mast cell in, let's say, the skin is probably months, maybe longer. Mm -hmm. And it is absolutely true that when we come to see somebody post-transplant who's allergic to penicillin pre-transplant, they're still allergic to penicillin for at least several months after their transplant. But their penicillin allergy can go away. Uh, so there's some turnover of mast cells and, of course, the IgE to the penicillin. Uh, the converse is I've also seen patients post-transplant who become allergic to the donor's allergy. Yeah. They start making IgE from the donor. That IgE then sensitizes them, and they, they take on the allergy profile of the donor. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Are there any more questions from the audience? Okay. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, I think you take a, you get a break. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate the opportunity and. Um, I think I have a couple more meetings, so I'll log back in in just a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You.